Hello students and welcome to video 8 of the evolution unit which is all about classification. So first let's talk a little bit about what classification is and why we have to do it. So on the planet there is a ton of what we call biodiversity. This basically means there's a lot of different and unique living things. So if we look at all the variety of organisms considered at all levels from populations to ecosystems, we see that, that we have already discovered 2 million different species. And there are millions of others that we know we have not discovered yet. So therefore, because scientists love to organize things, we need a way to organize all these different species into ways um, that make sense to us. So we use what's called classification to name organisms and group them in a logical manner. So the first person who came up with a, with a classification system that's wi wildly used today was a man by the name of Carlos Linnaeus. And basically, at this point, when he was alive, you know, they didn't know much about DNA, so the only way he knew to group organisms into groups was based off of physical characteristics. And when you use physical characteristics to, to determine who's related to whom, this is called systematics. That was the name of the science he was studying. And basically, Linnaeus came up with this system where he gave every creature a, a name that had two pieces. And his, his naming system he called binomial nomenclature, where binomial means two and nomenclature means name. So in each case, um, each species had a unique second part to their name, and similar species were grouped together and given a similar first part of their name. So for example, for humans, our technical scientific two-part name is Homo sapiens. Sapiens is specific to humans, and Homo is the general name given to any species who we are closely related to. So for example, um, Homo ne neanderthals, which were the um, human, the organisms that came right before humans, um, we're in the same group as us, the same genus, the same homo, but they had a different species. They were Neanderthals, not sapiens. A couple notes about binomial nomenclature. Um, the first letter of the first word is always capitalized. The species, the first letter of the second word is always lowercase, and the whole thing is always italicized or underlined. Um, and then, because some of these names are pretty long, once you've introduced it once in your writing, you can abbreviate it. So for example, E. coli, its full name is Esterichia coli, but you, we can abbreviate that as E. coli once we've established its full name at least once. Okay, so this binomial nomenclature, this system of naming, falls into a larger classification system that we call taxonomy. Um, so in taxonomy, um, we can see the original naming that Linnaeus was talking about, the second part of the name was the species, the most specific group um, that an organism can belong to. A group of similar species are part of what's called a genus, and then all the similar ge genera are part of what's called a family, all the similar families are part of an order, all similar orders are part of a class, all similar classes are part of what's called a phylum, and then all similar phyla are part of what's called a kingdom, and all similar kingdoms are what's part of a domain. So it's kind of like we go from the most specific down at species up to the most broad at domain. And I'm just putting the letters here representing the words because my picture didn't quite um, translate over to the video, but you can see it on your note handout. Okay, so a good way to remember this um, is the saying or the sentence, do kings play chess on fine glass stools? So that's a word trick to help you remember the order of the taxa or the order of the categories in taxonomy. Domain being the most broad and species being the most specific. Okay, so let's look at um, the taxonomy breakdown for a creature we all know and love, which is the household dog. So dogs are part of the animal kingdom, or kingdom animalia, so that's a very, very broad category. I mean, this diagram does not include domain. Um, they're actually part of the eukaryotic domain, which is not included here. So they're part of the eukaryotic domain in the animal kingdom. And then dogs are part of the phylum chordata, which means basically it means they have a backbone. Um, and then to get even more specific, they're part of the class... M mammalia, which is mammals, 
Um, they're part of the order Carnivora, which means they're carnivorous, they eat meat. The family Canidae, um, which means that's, that's the family that foxes and dogs and wolves belong to. The genus Canis, which means they're a dog. And then species Familiaris. So you can see we go from most broad to least broad looking at the taxonomy. Okay, so for a while, um, domains are a relatively new thing. For a while, kingdoms was the most broad category in taxonomy. But then there was this scientist by the name of Carl Woese, um, and he was looking at our RNA sequences to compare prokaryotes and eukaryotes, because he was interested in how they were relate related. Um, he used our RNA because our RNA is very well conserved. Um, because it's so important, it very rarely gets mutations. So any mutations in it can be considered important. Um, so if you use these sequences, you can really see important differences between different species. And he realized um, that there was a further way beyond kingdoms that we could figure out who was related to whom. So therefore, he took the kingdoms and put them into three different domains that I've kind of alluded to already. So the three domains are bacteria, archaea, and then eukarya, which is, are the eukaryotes. Um, so domains are the newest category, and they're the most inclusive, they're the most broad, and they contain one of the six kingdoms. So our six kingdoms are eubacteria, archaebacteria, protists, fungi, plants, and animals. So we can see the domain bacteria only contains one kingdom. It contains the kingdom Eubacteria. The domain Archaea only contains one kingdom. It contains the kingdom Archaebacteria. And then the eukaryotic domain it contains everyone else. So it contains protists, fungi, plants, and animals. Okay, so we can look at this another way. So here's a little cladogram showing this breakdown. So you could see the bacterial domain contains only bacteria. The Archaea domain contains only Archaea. And then the eukaryotic domain, all the eukaryotes, contain the other four kingdoms. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about each domain, uh, and that will round this video up. So you can see the bacterial domain contains only the eubacteria kingdom, and it's defined as having single-celled prokaryotes that are true bacteria. And true bacteria means they have thick, rigid cell walls around a cell membrane, and their cell, mem cell walls are made of a chemical known as peptidoglycan. Ar the, the, the domain Archaea also only has one kingdom. It has the kingdom Archaebacteria. And this, is this domain is defined as having single-celled prokaryotes that have different types of cell walls. Um, Archaea are pretty cool because they live in really extreme environments, like in hot springs or in um, thermal vents down deep in the oceans. Um, they are unique because their cell walls do not have pepti peptidoglycan, and their cell membranes also have really weird, unusual lipids that are not found anywhere else on the planet. And then finally, the domain Eukarya, the eukaryotes, has everyone else. So the protists, fungi, plants, and animals. And this domain is defined as having eukaryotic cells. So the last thing we're going to do is break down some of the kingdoms a little bit. Um, so in, within the eukaryotic domain, first we have protists. Um, so protists have cellulose in their cell walls. Sometimes they have chloroplasts. Um, most of the time, they're unicellular, but they can be multicellular. Um, and some examples that you might, we've talked about it already this year are amoeba, paramecium, slime molds, and giant kelp. Fungi have cell walls made of chitin. Um, they're heterotrophic, so they have to eat to make energy. And some examples are things like mushroom and yeast. Plants, we all know and love. We know they have chloroplasts. Um, they're multicellular, they make their own energy using photosynthesis, and we know plenty of examples of plants. And then animals are defined as having no cell walls, no chloroplasts, being multicellular, being heterotrophic, and we know plenty of animals as well. Okay, so here just a final um, table that summarizes all the kingdoms. This really doesn't have anything new in it, but I wanted you to have an ultimate source of, uh, source of information if you needed it. So that's video 8, see you in video 9.